Welcome to episode six of season two of Living Well. Today we are still continuing to focus on songwriting because I believe that it is so powerful. It's so powerful to be able to learn how to express your emotions in the art and then be able to, to process them to a deeper level. I taught a songwriting course a few weeks ago with Adam Roa and so many of you came to it and so many of you requested that we do it again. So we are actually doing a four week songwriting course it starts pretty soon actually so if you want to hop in there with us the link is below it's called right from the heart and Adam Rowe and I will be hosting it for four weeks we really want to learn how to write with you and how to become better writers together and we're gonna take deep dives into different aspects of songs and really break it down and so I'm so excited to be able to get together like a really cool intimate community. If you'd like to be a part of that with us, then click on the link below. It's called Right From The Heart. But let's get to our guest for today. She's an American country music singer-songwriter from Richardson, Texas. After graduating from TCU, she signed her first publishing deal with Warner Chapel. Her songs have been featured on the TV show Nashville, recorded by Keith Urban, Red Eldridge, Sarah Evans, Eli Youngband, Maddie and Tay, and so many more artists. Please welcome our guest for today, Miss Heather Morgan. Heather Morgan, welcome to Living Well. Thank you very much, Lindsay L. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? How have you been surviving in the past few months? I guess really the past year. Yeah, it's I can't believe we're at that timeline, right? We kind of are. I know. Uh, it's I mean definitely an adjustment, and. I, I took a while before I traveled or anything. I ended up, not intentionally, but I ended up back in Texas for like a visit with my sister and she's in California. So she ended up not being able to make it there before everything kind of, you know, locked down or whatever. But I would say the saving grace during that time frame was they started delivering uh, pictures of margaritas and enchiladas. <laughs> and so I was I like, I'm good. Amen to that. Amen to that, sister. That's yeah. so awesome. So I, I felt like that was like a, a strange, beautiful silver lining to everything. Yeah, no kidding. Welcome, welcome home. Okay, so I want to go way back. You had a band in college. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> and what was it like traveling? Like way back then, traveling around, playing on the weekends. Do you remember that time? Yeah, big time. You know, I was actually, it's funny you say that. Like I was talking to somebody last night about how I had no concept of like, the business side of music, I was just, not that I was totally in La La Land, but I would say the thing I learned about that time frame, like I, I grew up in Texas, so some of the gigs were like college bars. I remember playing a rodeo homecoming. Um, and like Texas is a big state. So between Oklahoma and, and Texas, mostly that's where I stayed. But um, I was, I would play like at OU and uh, but one gig, like some of the gigs were at dance halls and stuff that had like no air conditioning in the summertime and Texas is so hot, but looking back, I mean, it was so fun. But I, I was taught last night, I was kind of just giving kudos to my parents because I had just no concept of like paying a band yeah. <laughs> and I would be like, you know, the opening, opening person or like just the, the lowest part at some of these gigs were like, we were definitely not covering the band. And my dad would be like in the back writing the checks to cover the utility player or the electric guitar player. And like now as a working adult, I am like, how were you, you know, that had to be like $800 here and there a weekend at some point where like you, why <laughs> would you do that? But, um, but it was just such a cool thing to, I don't know. I had really great guys in the band and they really taught me how to quarterback a band because I can be kind of like, oh, I don't want to step on your toes or tell you how to do something. And they were really like, you got to tell us what you want to yeah. have happen. <laughs> like, we got to have some instruction. What incredible parents. I mean, the things you do. Yeah, it's, it's so crazy. The costs that go into a traveling band and the things that you don't think about. <laughs> Oh, I do. If, I do remember, like, my mom always loved when the band came through Dallas because she'd, like, have an excuse to make a really elaborate breakfast spread. And then we could all, we would get, like, air mattresses out. And the guitar player had, like, twin daughters. They'd be in, like, a playpen in the game room. Oh, 
I mean, we, I don't know if you call it roughing it because it was really fun, but, um, but it was definitely, you know, I'll never forget it. It was really cool. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's definitely, I remember we definitely roughed it for, for years, <laughs> but it, it's what makes you who you are really. Right. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so back in 2014, you celebrated your first number one with Beat of the Music. <laughs> Do you remember how you heard it was going to finally be number one? Yeah, I think, I can't remember, like, I think a Justin Moore song maybe was up there, kind of where it was happening. But I remember Troy Tomlinson, who was at Sony at the time, called me one day and I was, I think I was walking into the Sony building and he was like, I think you're going to get it. I think you're going to get the home run on this one. Um, and just, you know, he's such a busy guy and, and yeah. there's number ones. I feel like at that happening all the time there. So at the time when my phone rang and it was him and kind of the time of day, I, it was just, I kind of felt like, okay, it's safe to kind of feel like this might actually happen. Right. Yeah. 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 What a, what a special call to get from Troy. I mean, since we're focusing on songwriters for like the next few yeah. weeks of Living Well, and I just want you to talk about like, how does getting a number one song change the game? Like, did it, did it really change your life? Was it like a, a flick of a switch in, in a little bit of a way to be like, oh my gosh, I'm celebrating number one with Brett Aldridge. Yeah, I think at the time it felt like, I have a funny story kind of around that song is that um, the year before for the BMI awards, I had sent Jody Williams an email on, on why I wanted to be invited to the BMI awards. Oh gosh, I love you so much. <laughs> I was like, I, I really would love to go because last year I talked to Keith Urban and he said he liked this song. And so you never know who that could happen. With. Just like naiveness, but kind of at its pure form. And so yeah. Um, that was the year before Beat the Music became a thing. And um, the following year, I remember running into Jody Williams and I had like the song of the year trophy thing they give you. And Jody Williams was like, well, you really switched it up this year, didn't you? Like, <laughs> and in here he's like, it was just such a funny moment for us because it just went from like one side of, you know, the scale to the other side, winning winning the that award that night. But it definitely felt like, I remember Matt Jenkins, who's a songwriter in town, telling me this kind of metaphor for your number one. He was like, it's almost like for him, this is him saying it. He was like, it's almost like going in for that first kiss when you're dating somebody. It's like, you, not that you get it out of the way, but you're like, right. okay, <laughs> like, right. Got through that. <laughs> got it. Now yeah. figure out how to do it again. <laughs> and then the, the new kind of pressure that you didn't realize was going to be a part of it kind of starts to play into the game. but. Um, but yeah. it definitely was a big exhale moment. No kidding. Did you buy something to celebrate? I'm trying to, you know what? I went on a tra I think I went to Paris. Honestly, yes, you did. I'm a traveler, so I never. I don't. I was thinking about it the other day. I don't. I don't have like a car, or like a crazy house, or anything like that yeah. to really go for. Um, for like any of the songs that have been hits, but I have like good travel stories or places yes, you do. I know I always admire your pictures you're always going to cool places Hopefully we'll get back to that <laughs> one day yeah so I mean it's incredible to celebrate number ones but it's also incredible to like hear that Keith Urban and Sarah Evans and Kenny Chesney are recording your songs like I know as a songwriter, you know, we get, we get these things called hold, which sometimes means, okay, so Keith Urban has put your song on hold. He may put it on his record. He may not. Is there ever a part of the process where you actually get a call from Keith or Sarah or Kenny being like, hey, your song's ending up on my record? Like, did that ever happen? I had an, I had a thing with Keith once. I remember I got a text from him where I was walking to, I was back in Texas. I just landed back home and, um, and I got like a group text from him and it was to him and I think maybe Ross or Copperman or something. And, um, and he, he had been playing a show, I think in Canada actually, and just texted something about the song happening. And I, I was like, the people that I was visiting saw me walking in the yard and they just saw me kind of freeze in the moment. And they were like, it's okay to come in. And I was like, oh, Keith Urban's like texting me. And they're like, what? <laughs> just You're like, stand by. <laughs> like, one moment, I'll be back to normal in a second. <laughs> but yeah, and, it, and it's such a, um, I don't know, it's such an example of, like, for anybody to take the time to do that on that level. It's just, I don't know, it shows so they're like connection. Yeah, so. absolutely. 
I mean, so Ross Kofferman is also such an incredible writer in town. He's a friend of both of ours, but so people know a little bit about him. Um, what, what do you think it is about like finding that special relationship, like writing relationship with somebody? Like how did you, did you really find that relationship with Ross or was it just the first time you guys wrote together? It was like, okay, there's chemistry here. This is something we have to do more. I think there was definitely, I mean, I can remember the first day that we wrote, it was like 10 years ago, probably somewhere, somewhere in that ballpark. Um, and we had met at a songwriter festival, like, I think it was Key West, to be honest. And, um, Amazing. and it, and we probably honestly, we probably wouldn't have written together, but his neighbor ran into me at a restaurant and was like, Hey, I think you're going to write with my neighbor, Ross, I'll text him and remind him. And like the next Tuesday we ended up writing and, it just was really fluid and easy and um you know we just became friends and at the time we had nothing going on so um we were like just kind of became like a little brother and sister piling around and he was starting to get studio equipment so it was easy to like be like oh i'm gonna do an at-home demo like drop by on sunday and sing this song and you know yeah uh so yeah just be kind of kind of built upon that and then when he started doing tracks um I want to say one of our one of our first cuts together was that Keith Urban deal and then um yeah there's just kind of a, like you were saying when you find certain uh relationships there is kind of like a language that goes with it or mm -hmm. almost like maybe if they're a dancer you can kind of see where they're gonna go or even on I think it is really cool whenever here I start to sing we can do the the harmony and melody like as if you already know the song which is always yeah. kind of the magic I don't know how to put a name on that. Yeah, it's something That's you just special. feel for sure in, in the room. Um, I just, I love what you guys have found as a writing duo. And I think those are so oh, special when you find that. Um, do you have any songs that you knew immediately after writing them that they were going to do something pretty special? Um, there's one, there's one that Ross and I wrote with Dirk Bentley on his last record record um it's called stranger to myself and it's kind of like I actually wasn't supposed to be on the right that day there was somebody who got sick that day and I got a call at 7 a.m and um so oh, I just stories remember, like that love yeah, like that adrenaline going and I'd actually I'd save the idea I don't know if I told Ross about it yet but I'd save the idea for Dirks just in case this scenario possibly happened of the three of us writing but I just remember the whole, like everything that could go right in a writing scenario just kind of happened that day. It was just Amazing. a good vibe. Dirks had his dog there. We were at Ross's studio, so I was super comfortable with that. And yeah. they're such good friends and they have such a great history together that mm -hmm. it didn't feel like, it, it felt cozier than it did nervous, if that makes sense. Yeah, it totally makes sense. So that was just, that was a really fun day. And then afterwards, there just felt like an element of like, that was meant to happen. Almost because it wasn't supposed to happen. It totally felt like, you chose. yeah, that was kind of how that was supposed to fall into place. So that was one day that just stands out. That's amazing. So you've had some songs on like some big TV shows. Yes. And like, what's it like to hear your song on a TV show? Like when that episode or whatever comes out, do you immediately go watch it? Do you have your own little watch party? Do you not even watch the TV show? <laughs> You know, when, like, speaking at, like, Nashville, when that happened, yeah. I had a friend host, like, a big, like, a dinner, like, yes, we're gonna, like, this is when we're, we're gonna record it and start it over, sure. so we can rewind it, and, um, so it was, it was a song on, on, I think it was the second season of Nashville, but it is kind of crazy to think, like, I mean, sort of like the radio, but I guess it is different having a visual with it. Totally. Um, watching somebody else kind of take on like the characters of Nashville you know are taking on all these songs as if they're their own or written by them so the storyline that kind of carries it through in such a different way is a really just different experience it feels it all feels like kind of like it, it's not it's real but it's not real it's yeah cool. but I really love the um that whenever the tv thing happens I just think it's so cool and it's so instant like and it kind of feels like it's a shooting star like it's happening on that one moment right you kind of be ready have your eyes peeled ready for it to happen <laughs> so 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 true now you've just released your 
first album, yes. which I love so much. I I love I've loved your voice ever since the first time I met you, and I was just like, oh, who's you. that blonde chick singing? She is incredible. <laughs> Who is she's oh. incredible? And now I'm grateful enough to call you a friend in this dear life. But what is it like finally getting to release your own album after writing so <laughs> many successful songs for other people? Wow, it's man, that's such a it's. It makes me really happy. Like it feels like fulfilling and I can, I can, like if I had to go on paper and tell like a, somebody why I did it or what it looks like now, I don't, I don't know what my like rap sheet for that would really look like, yeah. but, um, but it just visually looked like what I wanted to. I know you're really good at having like a vision in your head and a concept yeah. and uh, especially with your recent album. So I just, I knew what I wanted to feel like and look like and sound like, and I, I feel like Paul Moke at Smokestack really did an awesome job of helping me get there, but it's really checked some boxes for me. Like it helped me get to go on the Opry and I got to tour with Jimmy Allen and Scotty McCray last year, which was just a really cool experience to be out among music fans and like just experience that side of it as a writer, as a performer. And then um, I've just always admired Lori McKenna and I was kind of in the middle of the process of it, of recording and she pulled me aside one night at the Americana Awards and she was like that record better be coming out like I want to be driving in my car and be able to listen to you and she's such a hero to so many of us so it was just kind of like this oh my gosh this is such backwards I used to listen to you driving to the beach like how do you even know who I am but she wrote a couple of songs with me but yeah I would say like anybody considering do let's on the songwriting side they want to branch out and do it I feel like the time and the like paying for it myself and all that stuff I don't regret any of that I'm really really proud of it yeah and it's a borrowed heart I didn't even talk about it should be it's so so good (laughs) and I mean Lori McKenna was like yes when is that coming out we love Lori so much so great so yeah was there a song that you particularly thought okay I need to save this for myself yeah there was two on the record that kind of actually there was well I will say three songs that um kind of were the okay it's time to do a record songs if that makes sense yeah absolutely there was one I wrote my first time writing with Paul Moak was back in 2015 and he didn't really uh, something about being in that studio I know you've been in that studio there's just a magic to it it is one of the most magical studios in Nashville and I will go on record and say that there's just like a vibe yeah there's just something really freeing about being in there it's a very just the low lights and all the instruments. I feel like you could be in London or Nashville. Or <laughs> Honestly. Anywhere. So I walked in the day we met and he was just like, pick up any guitar. And so he had like 60 guitars in there. So I picked this uh, black old, I think it's from the 1930s guitar that had birds on it. And just something about just that clicked and started playing the beginning of a hundred miles, which is a song on the album. And he just followed me. Like we just kind of unraveled this song and then, it went really well and I remember getting the demo and it felt just just felt different it didn't feel yeah. like a demo even though it was and then we wrote a song called We Were Fire and I remember he sent me the demo when I was about to fly out to LA and that flight's like four hours and literally it's all I listened to I just was like oh my gosh I really want to put this out I don't care if somebody else takes it later just I would like to kind of roll it out myself and then lastly there's a song called Your Hurricane that was like a, just a life story for me it was like a, a just a heart so heartbroken in that when I was writing that I was like by myself in Joshua Tree I'd rented this Airbnb and I just was I had all these notes and song voice memos and I just hadn't had time to just sit with them and so I rented this house and I remember I had this beautiful porch and it was just nothing around me like nothing and I stayed up literally all night like took a nap in the morning and then like got back to the song and just kept like almost like sandpaper with it just like yeah. kept finding it and finding it and got it simplified and then got back to Nashville and played it for Paul and he was like we're absolutely doing that he's like I'm gonna make the intro sound like the desert and so I think those three are the ones that really kind of I wrap my heart around those a lot I remember I talked to you shortly after you got back from that trip from Joshua Tree because I remember we ran into each other at the airport or something and I remember you talking about that song so it's so magical to see it like come full circle and now it's on your album do you see songwriting as therapy 
Oh my gosh, yes. Yeah, I can be, I can be, sometimes I struggle with, I don't know if struggle is the right word, but uh, there's some things I feel like, did I just experience that hard thing in life? Cause I'm supposed to turn around and like write it into music because I can articulate like, is that, I don't know if that makes sense, but like, that's my place to put it into the world in, in a certain form. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's times where I'm like, oh, I wish there was an off switch, but then there's other times like, thank God there's not an off switch. Girl, that's such a good way to put it. Thank God there's not an off <laughs> switch because sometimes it's so much better just to sit in your feelings and then be able to express them and make them into art. Yeah, you're so right. Yeah, and I don't, I feel like you probably, I don't know. Are you a night owl when it comes to your music sometimes? I mean, I'm everything. But yeah, yeah, if I'm like, if I'm digging into something, I'm definitely a night owl. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely, there's, I haven't really done it with like COVID and all that stuff. I'm sure there'll be a night, but I just remember sometimes staying up in the, like thinking I'd only been up for like a couple hours and just like playing, trying to find something that felt like the golden egg of the, the yeah. woman. And then the birds would be back out and it'd be like 5 a.m. Oh my um, but I think that's the, the definitely like the therapy side of it. But I feel like music saved me and is continuing to do so even, even through COVID, like doing the, I, I did have the panic moment of like, wow, if, are we going to not be able to work for the next six I weeks know. at the time, you know? And I it's been, know. So it really has been like such a sense of normalcy, even doing the Zoom rights. I know they can be you know, glitchy or whatever, but there has been a sense of like, oh, okay, I could, I have this part of me still, which is totally, I 100% feel you there. Well, Heather Morgan, I love you so much. Thank you for wanting to come on Living Well and share your heart and your brain with us and your brilliance. I can't wait to eventually get to see you in person. We need to write again. I know we do need to. And I also just have to give you so huge applause having to do that on zoom for um for your project it's just got so much vision and i just i don't know i feel like it's such a game changer and your sound is so locked in and you look gorgeous and strong and all the great things Girl, really well uh, as women in this industry we'll continue to unite and make yes. dope art together <laughs> thank you so much for asking me to do this it's really cool you doing such a great job with them thank you so much i will see you soon even if it's on yeah. the zoom right <laughs> works for me <laughs> all right love you girl I'll be back thanks all right you guys now i would like to talk about a few positive news stories there's so much going on in our world right now and from the beginning of quarantine when i started living well it has always been about just focusing on some positivity shining some light on those good news stories going on in our world good news stories going on in my friends lives and so it's the original reason I started Living Well, and we always have the Wellisms of the week. Wellism number one. A 70-year-old Air Force veteran is now a hero after saving his neighbors from a house fire. Marshall Helm was walking his granddaughter to the bus stop one morning when the bus driver pointed to smoke coming out of his neighbor's house. Despite the fact that Helm is currently battling cancer, he charged past the flames into the house to wake up the sleeping neighbors and safely escorted them back out the door. Oh my goodness, Marshall, you are here. Thank you for being such a brave man. At 70 years old, fighting cancer, and you saved a family from a burning house. You're incredible. Wellism number two. A Japanese man has invented an edible plastic bag to help save the deer population in his hometown. Hidetoshi Matsukawa, who lives in the city of Nara, decided to do something to save the sacred deer population when he found out they were dying from ingesting plastic bags. He teamed up with a local paper manufacturer and they are now producing bags made from rice paper and milk cartons. After lots of testing, the bags have been confirmed safe for both animal and human consumption. His dream is that someday these bags will be used all around the world. Hatoshi, that is incredible. I see you and I definitely want to try to get those bags over here. That's amazing. All right, Wellism number three. A two-year-old and his family dog went missing in Iowa, and thanks to a local police dog, they were both found safe. Dwayne Kemna, a Mason City police officer, and his dog Kylo are the heroes who tracked down the little boy who had wandered away from his home. Kylo located the boy near a neighborhood creek where they found the family dog sitting right beside him to protect him. Both the boy and his dog have been reunited with their family and are home safe and sound. 
That is incredible. I love the loyalty of the family dog who wouldn't leave his side. What a good story. Thank you guys so much for being here for episode six of Living Well. If you would like to join Adam Rowan and I in our songwriting course, the link is below. It's called Right From The Heart, and we would love to have you with us. I love you guys so much. I miss you. I cannot wait to get back out on the road. But until then, we will continue hanging out on Living Well. Let me know who you would like to see as a guest. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel and comment below. We'll see you guys next week.